Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And this time, since August is American Adventures Month, we're going to be sharing stories about adventures of some sort or kind that take place somewhere in the United States. And as we're sharing our titles, if you are interested in getting your hands on any of them, there are several ways to go about doing so. The easiest is probably to simply call your local branch of the Monroe County Library System and speak to the staff there and they'll be happy to assist you. As we're going through, if you see that a title is available in a physical format, you can request those through our online catalog and that web address is on your screen now. If you see that a title is available in digital format through one of our provided applications, you can go ahead and go straight to those apps through your device. Uh, one is Libby, and Libby provides downloadable ebooks, audiobooks, and also magazines. And the other is Hoopla, and Hoopla provides downloadable ebooks, audiobooks, and also movies, music, and graphic novels. And the great thing with Hoopla is if you see the lightning bolt next to a title, that means there is no wait and that everybody in Monroe County could have the same title checked out at the same time. So that's a nice little bonus with Hoopla. I am Jennifer Graneski and I am the area supervisor for the Dundee branches. And our question to kick us off this week is, if you were planning your own American adventure, where would you go? And I thought about this one, and I think I would go up to the Northeast only because I haven't really spent any time there. So I've not spent time in Massachusetts, Mass Massachusetts, probably because it can't say it, in Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, that area. I was, so I would like to go there. I've driven through there on my way to Canada, to Prince Edward Island, but I have not spent time there. So I think that's where I would go. Go, I would love to see like Salem and Boston. So I think that's where I would take my American adventure if I could take, you know, a month off and just slowly go through, preferably in the fall, so I could see the fall colors. So that's what I would do. Also with us this week is Jody Russ, who is the community librarian of our Bedford branch. And what would your American adventure be, Jody? Uh, I would actually do a coast to coast trip. So mm -hmm. I don't know how much time off I need for that, but <laughs> um, we did a lot of traveling when I was a kid. So we actually did drive out to the West Coast. I have a cousin who lives in uh, he's on the border of Washington and Oregon, so um, we've driven out there a couple of times, and yeah, I would be all over that, coast to coast. That's very ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> also with us this week is Jessica Otto, who is our head of collections, and where would your American adventure take you, Jessica? Uh, my American adventure would take me to a little town in Georgia called Tacoa where they have a mountain um, known as Curahi, which is my understanding it's part of the Blue Ridge Mountain Range. Um, and um, I don't think it's there anymore, but at, during World War II, they had the first ever parachute infantry um, training base was um, there at the mountain. And they actually used the mountain as part of their physical training course. And I think it's six miles up and down. Um, and I think part of the the um, they had to do it in an hour. I think that's what I read. You you had to be able to run up and down in an hour. If you didn't make it in the hour, then you were demoted back to the non-specialist um, <laughs> troops. Um, so yeah, it's always been a thing for me. I would love to go there and run this mountain, and just would love to see if I can make it in under an hour. Um, I, I mean that that's that's a little less than the distance of a 10k, which I know I can run in under an hour. But you know that's on like Michigan flat <laughs> land um so a mountain my closest to running a mountain is where i've run the quarry in south rockwood several times for the south rockwood friends um their fundraiser i absolutely love that i love the physical any kind of physical challenge so that final like going up just forever it's like oh i can do this like i can i'm gonna be i'm gonna be a better person when i get to the top of that so <laughs> i kind of hope that the same thing would happen when i got to the top of curry um and then afterward uh, maybe not immediately afterward, but a little later, if my legs still functioned after running a mountain, I would like to stop by. I believe they have a, a, a local, like a history museum devoted to um, 
um, the, the military base that was there in World War II. So I'd like to stop there. So yeah, a mountain run in a museum visit. That sounds like the perfect uh, Jess adventure. It does. Now it would not be the perfect Jennifer adventure because <laughs> I would die. But I love hearing about that and hearing about a place that I don't think I knew about before. So thank you, Jessica. You're welcome. And also with us this week is Adrian Childress, who is a reference librarian at our Bedford branch. And where would your American adventure take you, Adrian? Um, my adventure would be to the well-known Point Pleasant, West Virginia. <laughs> um, if you're not familiar, that's where the legend of the Mothman started. And they have a museum and they have walking tours where you can go see the sites where the Mothman was seen. Um, I, I like going to see weird, kind of strange, out of the way things like that. I made my wife drive with me once to, out to Centralia just to see the empty dead town. Um, but those those are the kind of out of the way things that I like. So definitely get myself down to West Virginia. Nice, thank you, Adrian. And just to piggyback off of that, um, J.W. Ocker, I might have his initials wrong, but he does a podcast and has written several books about oddities in America. And it's fascinating. All sorts of places I've never heard of that are all sorts of on the range of unusual places. So thank you, Adrian. And I am gonna ask Jody to go ahead and kick us off and share her American adventure stories. Okay, so I picked all nonfiction things because that tends to be what I do. And every one of these books are something that we had read for my Just the Facts nonfiction book club that we run at Bedford. And you know, the greatest thing about that is that I end up reading things that I probably never would have picked up before if I didn't participate in this particular book club. So that's a great reason to join a book club. It gets you kind of out of your comfort zone and um, doing something different. I'll start with the most recent because I just finished it the other day. Um, it's called Songs of America and it's by John Meacham, who's a well-known uh, historical author. He does, he actually does fiction and nonfiction, I believe, um, but it's him and Tim McGraw um, partnered up to do this particular book and it's about all the songs that have been written in honor of our country to develop our patriotism deeper in protests so it covers everything from before the United States was a country until um, fairly recent I guess it I mean the book was just written um, very recently but I think the last songs I remember them talking about had to do with uh September 11th. So, um, but it's it's interesting because you get the historical um, aspect from John Meacham and his research about the a deeper meaning of the song. So a whole lot of songs that I've listened to and, you know, I, I mean, most people that live in this country probably have heard, um, but maybe I didn't know a deeper meaning of those. Um, but then Tim McGraw jumps in to talk about the same song from a musician's point of view and talks about, you know, maybe where the roots of that song came from, other songs that it's related to. Um, so it, it, it's pretty interesting. Um, it was a little disappointing that Tim McGraw read the lyrics of the songs as opposed to singing the lyrics of the songs in the audio version. Uh, you kind of would have thought maybe you would have sang them, but nope, not so much. Um, so anyway, Songs of America was interesting to listen to. We do have it in print um, as an as an ebook as well. So it's available in lots of different ways if people are interested in that. Uh, reason we did that one is because our next book discussion is all John Meacham titles. So that's actually next week that that's happening. And then one of the other titles that I picked was called The Oregon Trail. Uh, we did um, we did the Oregon Trail. And you would think that's in its historical context, right? But this particular book is about a guy who decided to do the Oregon Trail in 2008, I think it was. And so he literally got a team of mules and got himself a wagon and he rode the Oregon Trail. Uh, he was having a midlife crisis and decided it's time to do something different. 
and um, it's really very interesting. So it gives you a lot of historical notes about the original people who drove on the Oregon Trail, but then also current day, you know, the struggles of actually following the Oregon Trail, particularly where interstates are crossing where you need to go. Um, so I found that really interesting. Rinker book is the guy who wrote that, and I think he's a uh, he does sports writing, I think, is what he does. I guess I should have looked that up before I talked to you guys about this. And then the last title that I had just to mention, and I think I actually talked about this one once before, was called The Food of a Younger Land by Mark Kurlansky. He's one of the authors that we love reading his titles on in our book club. Um, but this was really cool because it's actually a book that involves a whole bunch of recipes of all of the regions of the United States. It was written by a bunch of, it was a WPA project that Roosevelt put together for a whole bunch of out of work writers who couldn't find any way to make money during the depression. And so he sent these writers out to various different regions of the United States to find the family recipes, the things that they've been doing for generations. Um, that some of some much of which doesn't necessarily exist even anymore because fast food restaurants and in the interstates have made it so that you know people stop at Cracker Barrel instead of stopping at you know a restaurant that really serves the kind of food that you would have eaten in that area uh, originally. So it's really and it's a bunch of very short stories about the region that that they're in and then several recipes from that region uh well-known historical kinds of things so fascinating stuff excellent thank you jody and next i will have adrian share his american adventure titles i think you might still be muted Still muted. Yay, technology. There we go. Oh, oh. There, right there. Stay there. Okay. Okay. So I did not choose uh, I did not choose the fiction for my two titles. Um, I went with uh, very much fiction. But we might still be having technical difficulties. You're breaking up a lot. Testing now? There, yes, that's yeah. perfect. Yay, yay technology. Right. Sorry about that. I, no um, problem. I went the opposite direction of Jody and I chose two uh, fiction books. Although, I mean, one of them might be more uh, relevant nonfiction wise than it was before the pandemic. But we'll start with The Stand. Um, if you're not familiar, Stephen King is a writer of uh, horror novels. Um, And uh, this one involves a deadly uh, virus that sends people on a quest across the United States. I, I don't know if you can hear my cheerleading squad behind me. Yes. Yay. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah, so uh, Stephen King wrote this book in uh, 1978. It was about a uh, deadly pandemic that sort of sweeps away most of the populace. And then the remaining survivors sort of band together and journey across the United States. Uh, characters heading from Georgia and from New York, and they all kind of meet out west. There's a separate group that sets sets up camp in uh, in Las Vegas. Um, and he, in traditional Stephen King style, he uses a mix of real world setting and his own sort of made up places. Uh, the way that he does, but I don't know, you, you get a good description that the feels like description of like when they walk through Kansas and the, it's just endless cornfields and he walks through, um, you know, it's a it's a short light one sitting read. Uh, probably not. But, uh, <laughs> it clocks in. I don't I don't think you can buy the original version at 800 pages anymore, and I believe all the versions we have in our collection are the 1100 page version. So it's a it's a bit of a read. 
Um, but if you like horror, that's there for you. Um, I've also I also chose um, American Gods by Neil Gaiman. Um, in a similar sort of vein, it's a fiction book that details uh, the main character, whose name is Shadow. He's recently released from a prison, and he is on his way to see his uh, his wife, who he learns as he gets out of prison has died. So he abruptly changes plans to go and attend her funeral. Um, and he meets up with a man who calls himself Wednesday, and they set off on a what ends up spiraling into a war of the gods as a uh, old world gods, uh, Norse mythology, African mythology uh, have come over through various immigrants and there's sort of a war brewing between the gods of the old lands and the new American gods, which is from where that it gets its title. Um, gods of technology, media, that sort of thing. Um, but what's interesting about that book is that um, Neil Gaiman, when he talks about writing the book, he went on a trip and he just, Shadow's journey is exactly the trip that Gaiman took. When he stops at a restaurant, he describes the restaurant exactly because that's where he stopped. When he says he took a, an interstate north, he went that exact route and he just wrote it all down so that he could, you know, emulate what his character was seeing and experiencing. And so from that perspective, it's it's got kind of a cool, this is what Neil saw and thought as he was driving around and flying around the US. Um, I won't spoil the plot. There's, there's a lot there. But uh, if you like fantasy, a little bit of supernatural horror, it might be up your alley. Excellent. Thank you, Adrian. I did not know that about Neil Gaiman and how he had traveled that same path. That's interesting. Thank you. And let's have Jessica share her American Adventure titles. Sure. So, have you ever wanted to ride River Rapids in Georgia, explore deep, dark caves in Missouri, or gaze up at the Milky Way in Nevada? If so, my first title, 50 Adventures in the 50 States by award-winning author Kate Seiber, will show you how to do all those things and so much more. This is a guide to the 50 most incredible outdoor adventures across the United States, from Alabama to Wyoming. This book highlights the most wonderful landscapes and wildlife in the country. It takes you from the mountains of Maine to the beaches of California, the volcanoes of Hawaii, and to the forests of Virginia. Each state is given a full two-page layout that features a central adventure activity and information on how to accomplish the adventure. Each page also includes key information on that area's natural and cultural highlights. What brings all of this together is these gorgeous poster worthy illustrations by Lydia Hall that do a phenomenal job of incorporating each area's culture, landmarks, landscapes, and wildlife. Now, I know that for some of us, the thought of travel can be a little scary and stressful right now. So if you're not quite ready to travel across the country to find an adventure, no fear. In the back of the book, it contains a section on five adventures that you can find in your own neighborhood. So definitely check out that section of the book if a staycation is more your thing. Uh, one of my favorite things about this book is that it is um, written with a juvenile audience in mind. So if you are planning a vacation with your children or if you are maybe you're going to be traveling with a group that includes some uh, kiddos, be sure to share this book with those young explorers in your life uh, to give them a chance to choose an adventure of their own. Whatever excites you, there is something for everyone in this compendium as varied as the 50 states themselves. Whether you are looking to plan your next summer vacation, or just a weekend adventure in your backyard, the book is just what you need. You do not need any special skills or smarts to head out on an adventure. You just need a positive attitude and a willingness to try new things. So get out there and start your adventure. 
Um, so my second title is about an American adventure of a completely different kind. So if you thought you knew everything there was to know about the nation's first president, think again. George Washington Spies by Claudia Friedel is part of the Totally True Adventure series. This thrilling tale of danger, intrigue, and daring do centers on the story of the Culper spy ring from the Revolutionary War led by none other than General George Custer, aka Agent 711. When Washington took command of the Continental Army in 1775, he knew the value of having secret agents to gather enemy intelligence. After all, Washington himself was a spy during the French and Indian War. After Washington's first attempt at sending an agent into enemy territory resulted in Nathan Hale being captured and hanged as a spy, he was convinced that a group of spies rather than a solo agent uh, had a better chance of outsmarting the British. Washington turned to his director of military intelligence, Major Benjamin Talmadge, uh, to organize a group of spies. Now, Talmadge knew that he needed to find a group of agents that he could trust absolutely. His first recruit was Abraham Woodhull, a childhood friend from Setauket on the north shore of Long Island. Woodhull was given the code name Samuel Culper, marking him as the leader of the Culper spy ring. In time, more of Talmadge and Woodhull's childhood friends joined the spy ring, including a woman, Anna Smith Strong, who was their neighbor for many years. Each spy had a code name and a code number. Once the spy ring was formed, these agents were adventuring all over Setauket, Long Island, and even all the way to New York City, carrying vital intelligence that was crucial to Washington's plan for victory. In order to keep the intelligence safe, Talmadge devised a code book that he called the Numerical Dictionary that used numbers to represent words. Any messages that the spies carried with enemy secrets were written using the number code. That way, if any of the spies were ever caught by the British troops, um, they would just see a bunch of random numbers and not know what information was actually um, being revealed in these documents. Um, with the, now, with the help of a British doctor that was sympathetic to the colonists, Washington also discovered a way to write invisible messages on paper that would only be revealed when a certain chemical was brushed over the paper, which to me just sounds like something out of a futuristic sci-fi movie, not something from 250 years ago. Um, so they used this invisible ink to add secret messages to blank leaves of uh, pamphlets, of registrars, and they would even write secret messages in between the lines of printed books. So that way, if um, they were caught and it would just look like they were carrying a book, no one would know any different. Um, so and then for her part, Anna Smith Strong devised a way to hang uh, her laundry on a clothesline in such a way to send messages to Woodhall across the bay from her home. Who knew laundry could be so exciting? Um, <laughs> so then the, the latter part of the book uh, focuses on the impact that the spy ring had on the Revolutionary War at large. In fact, if not for this brave group of agents um, willing to put their lives on the line, the war may have had a very different outcome. Uh, so this particular book was written with a juvenile audience in mind. It has some amazingly detailed illustrations by Wesley Lowe. Um, what I found to be the most exciting part of this book is towards the end, readers get a chance to decipher uh, messages written in numbers using Talmadge's numerical code, uh, numerical dictionary, excuse me. How cool is that? Um, so we also have in the MCLS collection um, a book on the Culper spy ring uh, written at more of an adult reading level. Um, I believe that one is simply called Washington Spies and it's by Alexander Rose. And that book was actually the basis for um, the television series Turn Washington Spies that ran for I think three or four seasons on AMC. So if you haven't seen the show, it is a it's a highly bingeable. Uh, historical drama about the Culper spy ring. I, I do believe we had it at MCLS at one point in time. I'm not sure about now, but I highly recommend checking that out. Um, 
So I chose to highlight the juvenile um, audience title today since the kiddos are starting back to school. Um, so I think this could really be a great starting off point for a child needing to do a report on the Revolutionary War or American history um, in general. Um, they could definitely turn the tale of the call for spy ring into a fun, unique project on a lesser known area of American history. Although it's written for a younger audience, I recommend this to readers of all ages. Uh, the story is such an important part of our country's history and it deserves to be more widely known. Thank you, Jessica. That's fascinating. I'm always amazed at all the history that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so much history I don't know. <laughs> all right, and my two titles. Um, so I'm going to start with Ashley Hope Perez's Out of Darkness. Um, this has won all sorts of awards. It is fiction. It is. Um, it was originally published for young adults, but there's definitely enough there for adults as well. Um, and it definitely has some adult content. So don't give it to your middle grade readers. Make sure you give it to your older readers. But Out of Darkness takes the facts of the 1937 New London school explosion, the, which was the worst school disaster in American history, and it takes that as the backdrop for a riveting story about segregation, love, family, and these forces that come together and really destroy a lot of people. This is fiction but the school explosion did happen. And it's never been fully determined exactly what happened. And Perez starts off the novel with the school explosion. So I am not giving anything away. The very first chapter starts with that. And then she works sort of backwards in time and brings it back up to the school explosion. So Naomi is our central character here. And Naomi came up from Mexico where she was living with her grandparents because her father decided he wanted her and her two twin younger siblings, Beto and Carrie, with him. Um, he had sent them away after their mother died during the twins' birth. Um, and now he's decided that he is reformed and he is ready to have these children in his life. And so he brings them and they are in Texas and they are going to a white school and it is very uncomfortable and Naomi is very unhappy. And there is a lot of implicit and explicit racism that is shown toward her during the novel. And she ends up creating a relationship with a young black boy who doesn't attend the school and lives in the black portion of town. Um, and so this is telling their story. It's telling her struggles with her father. And then when the school explosion happens, it shows the very sad but yet very human thing of needing a scapegoat. When a terrible thing happens, who can we blame? because sometimes that's easier than dealing with collective grief and dealing with loss. Um, and so things get even worse for Naomi and her family. So this is a hard read. You know, when I think of American adventures, you know, I was looking for something in my reading list of things that I've read that are adventure-y. Um, but I haven't talked about this book yet, and it is a, powerful book about family and love and the dark side of our American history. So I think it's an important book. I think it's a worthwhile book and I strongly encourage everybody to read it who's of an age to be able to deal with some of the sexual and racist content that is in it. So that is Out of Darkness by Ashley Hope Perez. My other book is a little bit lighter. So I went with this one second so I could end with an adventure story. And The Ride of Her Life by Elizabeth Letts is a book that we read just recently for book club. And I will second what Jody said about if you need to push yourself out of your reading comfort zone, join a book club. Because I am not naturally a nonfiction reader, but we always end up reading several nonfiction titles for book club throughout the year. And this one was fascinating. 
So picture yourself as a 63 year old woman in 1954. So it's 1954, you're 63. Your whole family has passed away. You've just lost your father. The farm that you live on in Maine is going into foreclosure and you've done everything you can to try and save it. And you've been having issues with your lungs and breathing problems. So you go in and see your doctor and the doctor tells you, you have maybe two years to live. And he offers to find you a charity home that will take care of you for the remainder of your life. This happened to Annie Wilkins. And she was like, no, that sounds like not a great way to finish out my life. I think what I will do instead is take what little money that I have, and it was a little amount, and I'm gonna buy a horse, and I am going to ride that horse in 1954 from Maine all the way to California so I can see the Pacific Ocean before I die. It's 1954, it's not, you know, like this is 1804 or 1904, like there are highways being built. Like, I just, it just blows my mind that she even was like, that's a thing I'm gonna do, you know, forget that doctor. I got stuff I gotta accomplish in my life and I'm doing this. And when I first picked up the book, I didn't know anything about it. And I thought maybe she had been a horse rider her whole life. She was not, she was a strong main farm woman. So there wasn't any really fooling around with Annie Wilkins, but she wasn't an, a horse rider. They used horses to work the farm. They weren't typically riding them for fun. There was too much work to do. So she found a horse. She took her dog, Depeche Trois, and they headed out across the country. So it took them from 1954 to 1956. I will give the ending away and say that Annie makes it. So, but you get to learn all about their travels um, through little towns. And it just still blows my mind. Like she got lucky in the beginning because she met a journalist and the journalist wrote about her and national news organizations started picking her up. This was the early days of television. And so she actually ended up on some local TV stations. So when people knew they were coming, the police would sometimes help her and they would let her stay in the local jail cell overnight. Um, she put her horses oftentimes on fairgrounds because they would have a place for horses. Um, there's some really lovely moments. There's a point in the story, I don't remember where she's at, but they were just laying down the highway. And so it wasn't completely done and ready to be opened, but it was completely paved. So she got a chance to ride on that highway with no cars because quite often she was traveling on highways where there were cars, so her horses had to be able to survive that and do okay. And she does end up with two horses. She's gifted a horse later on to help her carry some of the load. But it was just fascinating. And Let's does a really good job of, of trying to help you understand Annie's mindset and also of moving you through what life was like in the 1950s, as opposed to what it's like in the 2020s and what differences there are in that time frame. Um, it was a really good listen. I just really enjoyed it. It is a heartwarming story. Annie, um, the person who does Annie's voice, the vast majority of the narration is in third person, but occasionally Annie has direct comments that came from journals or newspaper or television interviews. Um, and the person who does it does a main accent for Annie and it is fabulous. Like I felt like Annie was there talking with me. Um, you can see a couple of Annie Wilkins's television interviews if you go to YouTube, some of them are available because she did end up talking to Groucho Marx and there's somebody else, I can't remember who it was, but somebody well known. So if you want a story that takes you back to the 1950s, but is realistic, it isn't just warm, fuzzy nostalgia, and you want a story of a woman who says, Mm -mm. you aren't telling me what to do. I still got stuff to do in my life. Then make sure to pick up The Ride of Her Life by Annie Lutz. And thank you to all of you for sharing your American adventure stories with us. And thank you to those who listened. And we'll be back with more titles to share in a few weeks. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>